Louis, give, like, give an example of, of what we're trying to do and uh, what you can do with the peers right now. Okay. Okay, we want to start another extension for you that are interested in you. No accident that you're here. Um, I call it gold mining. And uh, what we're going to do uh, is uh, meet on uh, the second Tuesday, if we can, uh, here, same time, same place. And uh, in gold mining, we're going to try and focus on, uh, on writing. And we'll do some exercises. Um, as an example, uh, uh, if there is a story in the storyline, you can focus on one small part of the storyline. So what we'll do, we will give you uh, a prompt, a story. Maybe I'll give you the first uh, paragraph of the story, and then you are to launch way into the story, find a spot, and go mining, and write it in six, 10 minutes, whatever we give you, 15 minutes, and then you take that little part of the story, and everybody's going to have a part that's going to be different because their mind is, is leaping into a fictional area, and so everybody's experiences are different, and everybody's motivation is different, but we'll come up here, and we'll read what we write, uh, the nugget, so to speak, and some of us are going to have a polished nugget, and some of us, our nuggets are going to be a little bit crude and, and uh, not as, as, uh, as revealing uh, a motivation of the subject as we'd like, but it's a work in progress. So then you can take it, go back home, and then you can rewrite it and maybe turn it into a short story. Does that make sense? So we'll do some of that uh, on poetry. Uh, we can have a time for poetry and, uh, and, and do some things with that. Uh, we can do nature. We can do uh, 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 spiritual. We can do uh, death. We can do happiness. Uh, there's all kinds of directions we can go with our poetry. Enough? Okay. This man has written so many awesome stories. And so I wish you never met me because I'm so pushing for him to publish the stories. But I want every, the new people here tonight, like you, Danny, Daniel Smith, and you are who? Michael Verrett. Michael Verrett. Welcome, and welcome to the rest of you, and you're new to me. I've been here once. And it's been several months. Back. And what your name is? Cindy Poche. Cindy Poche. Okay. Tonight is our guest speaker night. Every other month we rotate and we have membership reading night where people, if you're a paid member, get to read five minutes of your material that you've written. Okay? And that's what we do every other. We have a little competition. Example of what he just said, give you a line who wants to compete, and then we choose a winner, and they're awarded a gift certificate. But... Lewis came up with some ideas. We we're trying to, to meet everyone's needs, and he came up with some ideas that really I said, honestly, we don't need to do that if we, uh, in this setting. Let's just create another extension of ripe skill. And he said, he think about it. Well, went from thinking to us now waiting to get confirmed if we can have the second Tuesday of every month. So if you're on the a membership list and you're a paid member, you'll get a newsletter. You'll get a note also uh, by email saying what the final decision is. So as of right now, that's what we want to do. So tonight is going to be speaker night, and we're trying to put all this information we're throwing at you into the news, into a uh, email. I'll do a mass email and kind of bring you up to date what we're talking about tonight so you'll know when the date is set for us to be able to have it possibly second Tuesday, same time, 7 p.m. right here. Okay, uh, this is the month of April ending, and we do the prompt competition, but we give you the, the idea. In May, category is poetry. 
okay, mother may I, okay, and then people compete, and then we as a membership vote, and the winner is awarded $15 gift certificate from Barnes & Noble, okay. So that's what's happening. Now, come July in June, when you come back in May, then we're going to skip a month, and we'll go into July, and the next prompt is going to be during the summer, that's going to be, and we decided what, Melissa? It's got categories fiction, and it's going to be uh, where are you going for summer? Vacation. Uh, where are you going for a summer vacation? So we'll always give you a topic. It's done every other month on membership nights. People can read. We have competition, and then you have different things we do. Now, when we have a speaker like we have tonight, we just let the speaker have the floor. And now that we were able to share a little bit about what Louis is going to be doing, but we would encourage anyone that's interested in this, learning how to create your characters and having fun, and it really does present awesome stories. So, with that said, that's all I have to say other than welcome to being our guest speaker tonight, Melissa Abraham, on the topic of translator. Translating stories, and now you can put it. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming out. And I have a little request I have to make of you. I have a very bad habit of talking quickly when I get excited about something. And I love translation. I love languages. So usually volume is less of a problem than speed. I do uh, medical interpreting. And because I have to speak Spanish uh, on a regular basis, I find that a lot of people tell me I talk way too fast, even my own mother. So if, huh? If there comes a point when I'm talking too fast, please let me know, because that is my normal, very bad habit. Uh, on the subject of translation, you know, it's, it's, I find that even when I was getting into translation, I had been through UL, I had got a Bachelor of Arts in French from UL, um, I went on to Mary Grove College, uh, I did an online program, and that's how I got my graduate certificate in French translation. Uh, but I learned that there are a lot of little techniques and things that we sort of take for granted. You know, I remember uh, I was showing my age in the days when we got the joke emails, when everything wasn't on Facebook. <coughs> there used to be these really funny emails we would get about translations that didn't quite go the way you thought. Some things on signs. And uh, I'm just going to share a few just to have some, we're just going to have a little laugh together. Uh, I saw one today, and uh, it had a picture of a hand with a slash through it, like, don't touch. The translation said, burn the hand carefully. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's another one with the no smoking symbol. Toilet button is on your backside. <laughs> okay. There was actually another one that uh, said, disable toilet. I'm really hoping no one followed those instructions. <laughs> And uh, there was one that I think was, off, was honestly meant to be poetic. I thought, I think it was meant to be a poem, but listen to the way this sounds. When you are striding on us, we are groaning under your feet. Uh. SOS from the grass. Uh. They probably were trying to say don't walk on the grass in a very classy, beautiful way. But the scary thing is, who translated that? Yeah. And would they do that to your book? Mm. Oh. That's what I want to be here tonight is to explain how to how to avoid that pitfall when you're looking for your book to get translated to make sure it falls into good hands. Because, uh, you know, so many things are on the World Wide Web, and it has been wonderful for me because I work from home, I am freelance, I have that independence. However, when you are looking for somebody, how do you know that they don't just have a pretty website, you know, that they really are professional? Because anyone can put together a beautiful website, but it takes years to really master translation. So. Um, if y'all don't mind, I've actually printed up a little page to help you do a search. Now, I'm not getting, this is not a promotion, I'm not trying to advertise, uh, but if you're looking for a good translator, the place to go is the American Translators Association. It is the national professional group that ultimately really certifies translators in the United States of America. It was founded in 1959. It has over 10,000 members who live in over 100 countries. And I'm actually very proud to say one of my great uncles was a president in the 1970s when they were coming up with a certification exam. So um, one of the goals is making him proud and passing the certification exam for me. 
Uh, it is to, to explain what a level of excellence that exam is, the fail rate is 85% last time I looked. The pass rate is 15%. So when you are a certified translator, it's not the same thing as saying you are a certified teacher. It is that difficult to obtain. So wish me luck. But uh, that is just to tell you what is a uh, level of excellence this group provides. And uh, you can actually find a translator very conveniently by going to their web page. I want to point out, it says atanet.org. Please make sure you don't put ata.org because it will take you to somebody completely different. Somebody else obviously got the domain name before they applied. Uh, when you get to the home page, there is a box on the right side of your screen, and the caption will say, find a translator or interpreter. You want to click on the advanced options. Now, the advanced option page, it is a little intimidating even when I look at it. But when you can go through the minutia, it really will help you narrow in on who you're looking for. You can choose the zip code. Where do you want this person to live? Would you want to work with someone, for example, in your own time zone? Um, I have worked for projects uh, in Northern Ireland, even in Germany. And uh, it's very interesting when you're trying to negotiate uh, Let's put it this way, I, I've been up at 2 a.m. sending projects and because that's when the company opened and dealing with computer hassles and everything. And between 2 and 4 a.m., that is a very special occasion. And so if you don't want that hassle, this way you can uh, say, okay, in my time zone, I can narrow it down to these states, for example. And uh, it will allow you to do that in the search. You can indicate uh, the language of your manuscript and uh, you know, the source language is, based, is the language that you wrote it in. And what we call the target language that's the language that you want to translate it into. So just know that that's some translator speak. Is sometimes we kind of forget in the industry that we use really odd language. So that's all that that means. Source language, what it's written in, target, what you want to translate it into. We're just a little, you know, that's just uh, language speak. And uh, you especially, you, uh, you can indicate whether you want to see all members who translate into that language pair or only your ATA certified members. And you'll know because the logo appears right next to their name. It doesn't have to be ATA certified, but if you find someone who is ATA certified, you know that that is a very highly qualified person. They have passed that big test, and I, I have tried that test, almost passed it, going to try it again this year. I can wow. certify that it is Tough, the hardest huh? test I've, it's the hardest I've ever taken. Wow. It is scary. I'm afraid to try it again, but I'm going to do it. And uh, you can also indicate the area of specialization that best identifies your manuscript. And to give them credit, they have a very detailed list of areas of specialization. In the arts, that's where you will find, um, you know, for, for books specifically, they say literature, but they also say literature slash children's, slash fiction, slash poetry, slash theory and criticism. So I'm guessing if it's nonfiction, just go generally with literature is my best take. However, if you're looking for films, you have to go down to the entertainment section. So for screenwriters, that would be where you would go. But that, that is very detailed. That just shows you they have a lot of different people who specialize in many different subject areas. And you can peruse the list and see uh, who, who seems best qualified, who seems like the best fit for you. Because honestly, it's every work has the right translator. You just have to find the right person. For nonfiction, for example, if you're writing a book about architecture, you might want to look at someone who doesn't just do literary translation, but specializes in architecture specifically. Sometimes uh, a lot of the way these translators come to the U.S. is they major perhaps in architecture, engineering, these fields back in their native countries, so they are experts. And you can find that, and you can search, you can uh, even, sometimes they, you can even uh, see their qualifications, they'll be very happy to share it with you. Uh, and also you can indicate whether you want someone, uh, which level of education you're willing to accept. Do you want someone who has an undergraduate or do you want someone who has a doctorate? You can narrow the field down to that on their advanced search. And uh, you can even specify whether, as they say, a T and I degree, that's what's written. It means translation and interpreting degree. That's all it means. And uh, you can even specify whether you want them to work with a Mac or a PC. And you can go into many other tiny details, but uh, it just know that those are probably, I think those are the ones that mainly concern us all. And uh, when you're producing the list, you can take the time and see who looks like the best fit for you. And it's important to look at specializations because um, it's kind of like with a doctor. You know, you wouldn't take um, someone who's broken their leg to a pulmonary specialist, you know, because they specialize and they're really intently focused on the respiratory system. 
you know, it's the same thing with the translator. If we focus in on certain areas in which we have the expertise, and those are the areas that we're best equipped to handle. And so when you uh, really look at someone's profile, you can tell who is just the best fit for you. So now, you've, you're looking at the profiles, you're getting an idea on who looks like a good fit. What do you want to do when you're getting ready to approach them? You know, what do you want to have ready? Because uh, we've had a lot of really excellent speakers in the past who've all mentioned editors. And really the way you want to approach a translator is the way you're thinking of when you're trying to approach the editor or even an agent for your book. It's a, it's a lot like the same process because you have to think, okay, first of all, what languages do I want my book translated into? You know, it's something we sometimes don't think about, but in certain countries they have a market for uh, certain topics that is uh, more keen than in other countries. So maybe, for example, uh, if you like Japanese anime, for example, and your book is like that, you would want to invest in the Oriental or Eastern languages probably more than in France or Germany. You know, just think of where the best market for your work is and where it's more likely to just be a good investment for you, in that sense, you know. And also, when you're thinking about the which languages, you have to think about what is your budget, because it's always good to have more than one language, but unfortunately, translating doesn't come cheap. Uh, the standard wide way of pricing, this is just uh, what is usually done across the board, is uh, translators charge by the word when it's written text. We only the standard for charging by the hour is usually for the interpreting, the spoken side of the business. So when it's a document, you can bet on it'll be a certain price per word. And the way we determine, at least the way I do, is to be fair, when the final document is complete, uh, usually I'll go to Microsoft Word, you know, whatever enables me to do a word count, and whatever appears, you know, in the word count section, <coughs> that is what I put on my invoice and charge. So it won't be, you know, this the word count before and the word count after. It's only the word count of the target language. So no, don't worry, you don't have to be worried about that. But um, <coughs> that's just an area, I guess, that I wanted to talk about. And because I know budget is a very sensitive issue for all of us. But this is also kind of a way of knowing what kind of translator you want. This is a revealing area. Because uh, there's a lot of mistakes we go through when we're first beginning. You know, when, when all translators are starting out, Sorry if I'm slurring a little bit. Like I say, I get excited when I'm talking about this. When all translators start out, there's a few key mistakes we sometimes make. We want group work, and we don't want to turn anything down. So the first thing we'll put on our profiles is, oh, we don't just translate French into English, we do English into French. Oh yeah, we'll do Spanish into English and English into Spanish. Same thing for Italian too. Well, we've actually come to find out that some people can if they grew up in all those countries and they were able to have education in the school systems, there are some people who really are that fluent. And you can see on their profiles that they are ATA certified, go with them. If they're ATA certified in that, you can really trust their education. But for those of us who you can tell have never left the United States based on our profiles, if we haven't mentioned that we've lived in the country for several years, if we didn't go to school there, chances are it's not someone who's trying to take advantage. It's just someone who really wants work and doesn't want to hurt feelings. You know, they don't want to take, say no. But that's usually someone who doesn't have much experience. And you can tell when you read the translation. You might get one of the things I read at the beginning of the work. And so an unusually good sign of that is, is that they also will promise to have your work turned out as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. Now, there's nothing wrong with a fast turnaround. Uh, in, in fact, we, we actually have some translation programs that help us do it. Uh, not just faster, but actually more accurately. I use a program, for example, called Trados, and if I'm thinking, okay, wait, which synonym did I use for the word happy? Did I go pompon or heureux? I can go back and isolate everything that has that English word happy and check to see what I did in the past and check the consistency. And if I did something different, I can decide which of the terms is accurate and correct it in every sentence in there, and I can do that within five seconds. I don't have to go over every single page. It will isolate that for me. So that's quality control that we can assure with our technology. That's the this type of speed you want to look for, not just buzz through and give you the fastest translation possible because there's a reason you don't go, want to go to Google Translate. One sentence has a time to say, where is the grocery store? Google can handle that. Anything longer? Brace yourself. <laughs> like we say, you get what you pay for. Google Translate is free for a reason. Just walk away. 
<laughs> Sorry. I have, to, I have to make those jokes because people ask me what I think of Google Translate a lot. And I have to say, well, that depends on what you want me to translate on Google Translate. <laughs> but uh, all joking aside, really, uh, a translator who does charge on the upper end of the budget, it is usually someone who is very studious. Uh, the reason it's on the upper end is they want to allow themselves just that little extra breath to say, okay, well, how does this turn of phrase go more colloquially, for example? Did he just pick up the cell phone or did he grab the cell phone? Did she rush out the door or did she tiptoe? You know, or did she scoot? Did she fly out the door? They want to take that extra breath to make sure they have the image right. Uh, I, for example, uh, there was a case I was writing where the subject matter was religion. The author wanted to draw a contrast between what we call the fall of man and then the redemption. So she wanted to draw a visual picture. I was thinking, okay, what if I use the word rise? And I did some research and I found that when you use rise in that context, it usually refers to books that are atheist philosophies. So considering that that would have had a negative image, you know, considering what she wanted, I <coughs> said, okay, do you still want me to try to create this image? Or do you want me to go with more conventional phrasing such as, and she opted, of course, to plan B. But that's what a good translator will do, is we will do the research to find out whether something we're saying will cause that, you know, that image in your mind that you don't want to be planted. Like I was telling my teacher, for example, I'm a teacher in Michigan, she was asking, where can you have certain little difficulties with language? I told her about the word Trinity down here, because you know in religion we know the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what do cooks say? What is the Trinity down here? Exactly. So I told her, you know, if we're dealing with Cajun French, we have to get very specific, because uh, we might start thinking of a recipe at the wrong time if, you're, if we're not careful. And so that's what a good translator will do. We will know these little cultural differences, and we will know how to refine that so that if you want them in, they'll be in. You know, if you want to make a play on words, you'll get the play on words if at all possible. Because sometimes some things just can't translate the same way. It just happens. And uh, but we'll let you know where those areas occur and ask how do you want us to work this out. And that's what you're going to get for a good translator. That's how you want to look for them. You know, basically, I just uh, I just want to share some tips because I, I know what it's like uh, as the translator, and I know that if I was the author, I I know what I would want for my book, and I want to make sure that. You, you know, y'all could have the best you can possibly find. <coughs> Any questions? I thought? Okay. So moving on, when you want to get to ready to approach this person, uh, I'm just going to give you a scenario of something that happened to me and it resulted in um, why I ultimately had to turn a project down. This is just to make sure it doesn't happen to you. Uh, someone approached me and uh, I first the first thing I did is look at her letter. Because the scary thing is, with everything being online, there is a, and I couldn't believe this when I started out, I could not believe this, there is honestly a sector that spends its time targeting translators for scams. And it sounded very strange to me when I first heard people reporting. I really didn't believe it. But then I started getting these really funny emails uh, asking me, to, uh, will you please translate my paper from English into Chinese for this conference in Paris? They didn't read my profile because I don't work with Chinese. My <coughs> languages, uh, to get specific, are French into English, Spanish into English, and Italian into English. No more. So when they asked if I could translate into Chinese, that was the sign number one. Then I noticed that certain normal words were, mis were misspelled. <laughs> like they left the H out of T-H-E, little things like that, or they left the A out, they didn't use correct pronouns. It turns out that a lot of uh, people who run these scams, they don't pay attention to their English. And especially, they only give you one way of contacting them, either just an email or maybe just one phone number, but that's it. But it's usually just one email. And so that's one thing that I've learned to be very careful with is if I receive an email, I want to see how many ways I can get in touch with you. Do you have an office line? Did you give me your cell phone? Did you give me an email address? If I see those, I'm going to trust you. I, I, you know, I can research and see that you're a real person. But if I have just that one email, I'm probably not gonna keep it in my inbox for very long just because I, I actually almost got taken in by a scam. There was someone who said, would you translate this essay for me? And it was in my early days when I was still an amateur, I agreed to do it into French. Again, like I say, I, we all learn from our mistakes. But this person then started behaving very oddly. 
and she starts offering to pay me, and she hasn't even seen the work. And the work is still two days away, but no, let me send you the check. Come on, what do you project it will be? So I finally started getting a little nervous. I did a little Googling. I found that this essay was written in the 1950s by somebody else. I almost got had. And I found another article. There are for scammers specifically targeting translators who would send you the check ahead of time. There'd be something wrong with the transfer. And in the long short of it, they'd find a way to get into your bank account and steal the money from you. Mm. I got so lucky. But needless to say, that's why I'm letting you know. So when you want to approach a translator, the one thing we say is try to write it very the way your English teacher would be happy to see it. You know, correct grammar, correct, um, but, you know, like you say, punctuation, grammar, syntax, verb use, check for spelling errors, because uh, we can let it slide if it's a, lo a long word or something where it's the only mistake, but if not, that's why some of us wouldn't press the delete button. It's just we can't be too careful sometimes. And I tend to be on the very cautious end since I almost got that. Another one uh, to look at, too, is, uh, like I say, this woman now, like I said, I didn't press the delete button when this piece came to me. She was asking if I could translate an Italian uh, novel from English, you know, it's Italian into English. So I looked, her grammar was good, her spelling was good, there was nothing wrong with it. I saw that she, now she didn't just give me her email, she gave me the Amazon page for her book. She gave me the Goodreads page for her book. So I could research that. I could actually look, so I checked to make sure that there were no viruses attached to the emails, I'm very thorough. And I went to the pages, but here is what caught me. I went to the Goodreads page. She only had one review. It was five stars and she had written it. That's not a good sign. Then I looked at the word count again. It was a young adult manuscript, but it wasn't fantasy. And it was well over 100,000. I really think it was in the 120,000 word section. And usually, as they tell you in the publishing world, that's not usually an acceptable link for young adult manuscripts. That's on a very, very long end. So unless you're writing the next Harry Potter book, chances are you want to go a little shorter. And uh, so when I looked at that, I had to quote her the upper end of my budget because I was thinking, you know, literary translators are more flexible with their um, pricing than others. We really are because we understand that these are large Man manuscripts. We know that everybody has a budget. We understand that. And sometimes we might say, well, how about I, uh, I charge, for example, six cents a word, but perhaps a certain percentage of the royalties or the returns. You know, we'll negotiate a contract such as that and see if we can come to an agreement. When I saw that it only had one review, it had been out for over a year, it was that long, I didn't really think relying on royalties would be a good idea for me as a business person. No. So ultimately, we parted ways amicably just because I had to quote too high a budget. But that is just one little thing just to consider is, you know, we've had a lot of good people talk about editing your manuscript, and that's, these are some things that editors might catch. You know, they might look at the word count and say, this is good content, but maybe you can whittle it down a little bit. You know, like when you're preparing to submit something to an agent, because if a translator looks at something that's written very well, very uh, succinctly, very concisely, you call her attention. You know, because uh, I, I actually sometimes when a client submits something to me, I go to the Amazon page and I read the samples. You know, uh, I want to know what the vocabulary is. Uh, is this in the subject matter I'm comfortable with? It? How fast do I think I could do the turnaround? And I will read literally the entire sample Amazon will give me, even if it's six chapters, even if I have to sit for three hours, I'll do it. You know. And so, uh, just think about that. And I would say even wait a little while before you're able to get on the market. Let it get those reviews. You know, let people write in. Because the more five-star reviews we see, and the more different last names, if they're from other parts of the country, this looks good. I can, be, I can go down on my price. We can come to some sort of negotiation. I'm very happy to negotiate. And, I think, and a lot of translators, we think that way too. It's, I'm just saying from my personal experience, but I think that that's something you'll see across the board. So I would say just follow some of the advice that we've had from uh, for editors, you know, the way you would approach an editor or an agent. And it's just, um, it's like we say, we're artists, but we have to think with the business side of our heads sometimes, you know. So I'm sorry if I was, if no, I did a little good. too harsh. Or, no, no, that's great. But I just know what it's like from my point of view, and I just know that if we all understand what we're looking at, it, it just makes for better uh, chances for us. And in the end, 
uh, when you approach a high quality translator with a manuscript that has been through an editor, uh, with a very good package of the way your letter is presented with the links, you have a very good chance of striking a good book deal. You know? And um, let me take a look at <coughs> picture. Yes, that's basically uh, a lot of what I've mentioned. And uh, again, last, like I said, uh, I can't stress enough to check your translator's profile, you know, right before you submit. Because the beauty of it is for a lot of the common languages, there are many translators who specialize uh, in this, in literary, especially if you're willing to go outside of the state. Because we really, I, I honestly, I can tell you, I have worked for clients as far away as Northern Ireland and Germany, Colorado, Missouri, Iowa, all over the place, Florida, as well as local. And so we, we're comfortable working with people from other time zones. So if you approach somebody from out of state, uh, that is not going to get them worried at all. That's not a warning sign we look for, because we're comfortable working out of state. We work from our computers. We understand. So if you want to expand your search, there are many, many people you can look at. So you can look at their profiles and see, like, if you're doing children's literature, if someone specializes more in the adult romance sector, they may not be the best fit for you. Or if they're especially do business or finance. Because some people, that's all they do is financial or business translation. So the books they would do would be that nonfiction yeah. section. And so you'd want to look for somebody who has translated in those. You can even find out what books they've translated. You know, you can even approach, uh, you can look, you can even Google just to see. Because sometimes they give translators credit, sometimes they don't. We're kind of used to that. No big deal. We're always excited though if they give us credit. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, yes ma'am. Oh, I'm thinking of uh, doing a book of haiku poetry. And I would like to, since that's a Japanese form, mm -hmm. I would like to be able to get Japanese uh, mm -hmm. calligraphy, is that the right word? Oh, yes. To go, how would I go about finding someone who could do that translation for me? That translation, uh, I would say if you're looking for, uh, do you mean the, the calligraphy, for example, the, or a, a Japanese translator? Or do you want, is that for more like illustrative purposes, the calligraphy? Mostly for illustrative. For illustrative, I would say you could look up. Uh, I know that, that you know how there is a um, a writer's guild. I, I believe for like screenwriting, I believe there is an illustrator's guild. Uh, you could perhaps uh, do some online searching to find uh, because there, it's a different organization. I'm not as familiar with the illustrators. I'll, I'll add this. Uh, I used to be with the. I used to be a homicide detective in the city of Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. And when we had translation issues, there was a, a number with LSU that we could call. Mm -hmm. So uh, USL, it's always going to be USL to me. Mm -hmm. They probably have an online staff that can direct you to somebody that was a Japanese student who mm -hmm. can provide that for her. Oh, absolutely. And like we say, if you, uh, if you follow the address on the uh, Translator Association webpage, they do have English into Japanese. That is a definitely a language pair, so there will not be a problem. I'll probably use that. Did you? Yes. So long as you have that, because that really, that's the reason I recommend it, is because the ATA, anytime you see a translator organization in the United States, the ATA is the umbrella organization. They actually have a list of accredited translation programs, and that's how I found the school I did because they've met a specific set of requirements that uh, you have to qualify to even take the certification exam. You have to qualify. And uh, I wanted to make sure I went to a school that allowed for that. And uh, it, you know, because then you have to prove several years of experience. You have to have people give you letters of recommendations. You go to one of those schools on a graduate level, you don't have to do any of that. So I made sure I went to a good school. And so that's why I really recommend they're a good umbrella organization. If you find someone affiliated with them, you're getting a professional because, uh, again, I know I've said the word scary quite a lot, and I apologize, but translation, um, it's not as widely regulated a field in the United States as it is, for example, in Europe. You know, And so it tends to be a field that people stumble into. Um, sometimes if they've just gotten to another country, if they're a spouse of someone who's moved into here. And some of them were quite good. I mean, many of them were I'm not, I'm not going to say some, many of them are very highly qualified professionals, but there are some who they just, you know, they get called, sure, I'll take the job, but not all of them behave professionally. I, 
I've had a few horror stories. Um, there's people I've translated with who said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're here. The last person who came was wearing sandals, and he was talking to everybody in the room like he was buddy-buddy with them. You know, certain things are, my gosh, I can't believe it. You weren't even looking at your cell phone. My last translator, I was, that's all she did. I didn't know if she actually heard what the doctor was saying or not. So that's the scary thing is there really, uh, there are many great professionals, but there are a lot of people who behave much less than professionally. And I'm just very sorry that I've ever been told those stories. And I would hate for that to happen to you. <laughs> um, I would like to know about how you interact with publishers when someone has already published a book or books and they are interested in maybe translating. So how do you deal with that with, the, with publishing companies? They, yes, they, uh, they sometimes contact me. They occasionally do contact me. And uh, I go through the same steps that for anybody else. I, I check on their website first of all because Believe it or not, there actually are some hackers who will hack even translation websites. They'll steal their domain name and they'll put a tiny change, even if it's just one letter. But they create false websites and they've been known to do that to people. So first I'll make sure that this publisher, that this isn't somebody pretending to be them. And then when I know they're real, uh, I, fir I first look at the book they're proposing, especially if it's already been published. I read through it. And then uh, I have a set of questions that I like to ask, especially um, the translator perspective. Um, when it's a publishing company, I'm more likely than not, I'm not sure if I'm going to be communicating with the author directly. I may be merely talking to a contact there. But I want to know how much contact are you comfortable with during the project? Because I know some clients, they prefer just contact me when you have questions or contact me maybe with all of the questions together. Or contact me once a week, twice a week, it all depends. Uh, what you really want in a translator is someone who's not going to be afraid to ask you questions. <coughs> You know, who might, uh, for example, if we find that there's a typing error because um, I, I, some of the books I've read that have been published in the last five years, typing errors on just about every page. Shocks me personally because when I was growing up that was not the norm, but now they're churning out books so fast, there's mistakes. Yeah. Sometimes we have to let them know because certain words, one letter can mean the difference yeah. between what the translation gives you. And legally, According to our profession and the code of ethics, we have to translate exactly what we're given. So trying to correct that translation on our own is not necessarily ethical. And so that's why we contact, that's why I, I do back and forth with, with clients on those issues. Um, uh, you know, especially, we, we, we also, I, I read the language through because I want to know how comfortable someone is with my talking to them. Because as artists, sometimes we have fun with our words. Oh. And uh, we forget that there's, you know, levels of plausibility in language. Like, um, okay, I'm just going to use some pop culture references just to give an example. Like, you know how there are some people who avidly love Star Trek and love Star Wars, and they'll tell you the two don't mix. Well, if someone whipped out a lightsaber in Star Trek, there's some fans who would just run out of the theater because they don't use lightsabers in Star Trek. And if you heard Luke Skywalker say, "Set your lightsaber to stun." the fans would also cry foul in Star Wars. You know, because every one of these, you know, worlds has their rules. Languages are the same way. Like if we're making a biblical reference, we've all heard of the narrow gate, right? Uh, what if someone wanted to say it in a different way and said the skinny gate? That would sound kind of funny to us if we heard it in English. So we have to think in the other language. Is there a way that this would make sense? You know, how would this read to them? So if I see certain little artistic liberties taken like that in the text, I want to understand, um, is this a, a metaphor that can be created that I can do, or do I need to resort to conventional language? Will the author be comfortable with my contact with him if I see certain things and I have these questions? Because some people, uh, they, they really only want to get that text, you know, let me know when you have all the questions for chapter so and so. But sometimes you may need to send more than one text. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one thing I like to ask, please be open to phone calls. Because I can't tell you how many people these days say, don't call me, text or email. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm here to tell you no. I, I follow the instructions, I do exactly what they say, but I know how this is going to turn out. I either explain myself very well, and everything turns out well, or they say they don't like my idea. But for the same reason I proposed it, they just didn't understand what I was saying, but they say do this instead. 
well, I know they don't want me to call them up and, and resolve it. Verbally speaking, there's a lot that we can communicate with our words. And one phone call can solve problems that 10 emails can't even get yes. through. Right. I've, yeah. I've seen that happen, honestly. You can email someone back over a space of one day to solve maybe one problem. One phone call solves it in seconds. Yep. Is that just one thing I would say be open to? So one of my lessons learned was I did a program in Ecuador, so it's Spanish. Yes. So yes, yeah, so I write my program, make my handouts in Spanish, and get there, and the interpreter looks at it and says, well, I don't know what these words are. <laughs> and I said, well, they're Spanish. She says, yes, if you're a Castilian Spanish speaker, but if you're not an Ecuadorian. Mm -hmm. So there it is, not all Spanish is Spanish, just like not all of them. English is English. You're right, thank you. And we a lot of translators, when we hear someone talk, they're like, you're gonna get someone fast, is what I can tell you for your work, because you're very informed. This is someone a translator says we can work very well together. Honestly, I'm telling you like that. Honestly, I hear that and think I can work with this person. This is great. I did a photo book on uh, City of Venice, and so I see what. How do I say this? Parlo il po di italiano. I understand a little bit of Italian, but I didn't trust my own Italian. So I had three bona fide Italians from three different parts of Italy exactly. go over it, and they go, Ah, don't worry. We don't know what the words mean. We don't agree on it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> However, the reviewer, you know, wrote me a scathing thing that there were three words that he just totally disagreed with and that he himself yeah. taught proper Italian. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. It's, it's like you say, you know, we all have to be so cautious about <coughs> our work. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen that happen, uh, especially when you get into dialects. Mm -hmm. You know, dialects you can never be too cautious with. So if you want something done in dialect, like I would, uh, I, I saw a book, for example, recently that one of the characters was English. One of the questions I would ask somebody is, okay, for him specifically, do you want me to use more British English, for example? We don't, the, if you watch, like, I love the BBC. I don't know how many of y'all are fans, but I watch Merlin, Sherlock, Wallander, all of those things that are on the BBC, you know? Uh, when you ever hear, they never say, want to go get some coffee, they say, a coffee. Or they never say cookie, they say biscuit. Just little tiny sure. touches. Uh, when my husband and I went to Ireland, for example, we learned that a parking lot is a car park, and uh, you don't want to ask somebody for a ride because that actually has some very negative connotations. You want to ask, can I have a lift? Yeah. Oh, so okay. if, if, you, if, like we say, because uh, yeah. I'm not from England, this is just yeah. someone who watches the yeah. television. Yeah. I have. Are you comfortable with me dealing with Britishisms, or would you perhaps want to see somebody who has lived in both England and America and can? Right, differently depending on where they're from. In England, you don't yield at an intersection; you give way. And exactly. the signs say "give way." Yes. And they could save so much money in paint if they would just make it yield. <laughs> and the signs say "way out, right? so, You know, just little things like that. Uh, yeah. And so that's another thing too that you'll find for a good translator is they will look at the cultural significance and they will know if uh, the you know how to make those little differences, how to give that extra little quality to your phrase, how to create that visual metaphor. Because they won't just look at a sentence by sentence, they'll look at the whole paragraph. They'll look at the entire chapter as a unit and try and <coughs> as one and try to make sure that the picture is painted. You know, that the metaphor is there, that it's colloquial. Because as translators, we sometimes you'll hear some translators really balk when you call someone who does the written work an interpreter, especially someone who does the speaking work a translator. You know, it's something that happens. But if we're honest, sometimes the skills overlap because the skills related to translation, this is not something I'm doing like a UN interpreter. I read this, okay, okay. Let me double check some synonyms. Which one goes better here? Is this in slang? Is this a teenager talking? Is this an adult? I'm going to check that. I have time. As, uh, when you're interpreting, you have to go off the cuff. But sometimes when I'm, do, when I'm doing writing, we know that if you go the dictionary word for word right. rendition, it's not going to read smoothly. It's not going to feel natural. So you have to interpret. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so that's what you're going to get in a high quality literary translator is someone who is comfortable going with the flow, asking you questions, make sure your work looks good. Yes, ma'am. Would you ever try and translate Paul Brobridge? You're going to have a problem mm -hmm. because it is. So very different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I remember I worked as a reporter, and I have I was doing an interview in, in Pearl Bridge and talking to this old couple, and uh, I spoke French. My parents, I was their first language, so I had picked up enough of it, even mm -hmm. though I wasn't very proficient. 
I could understand mm -hmm. and speak it. But uh, man, some some of their phrases just <laughs> were were out of sight. Oh, you're right. Absolutely. Because there's a lot of little cultural things too. Yes. What about um, English from the 1920s? Yes. Or from another era. Yes. They don't speak. This, they didn't speak the same way we speak today. Do yes. they have people who specialize in that, or do you have to search for professors that study these eras? You probably could look at somebody who likes to do historical fiction. I would say uh, look for people who perhaps are history buffs who are really into that time period. You know, ask them those questions like, do you feel comfortable? Using the slang terms from the 1920s, you know, so telling someone they look dapper, for example, when they appear in a suit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a good question. Definitely ask them that. That's a way because you, as a as the writer, you want to be in the driver's seat. You want to be in control. And if this person doesn't feel comfortable, you can say, I, I think I need another translator for my project. And, and read books that. from that time period. You know, read a lot of Gatsby because yeah. sometimes it's not just the words; it's the cadence they use as well. Like, okay, if you want to laugh. This, this is a true story. Uh, someone asked me to do some Smurf ebooks a few years ago, just a, some Smurf ebooks. Yeah. And uh, I was a kid in the 80s. This was fun. Yeah. Yes. But I hadn't watched Smurfs in so many years. I actually found a website that would let me watch a few episodes to get the vocab in my head. So I, this is Friday morning. My husband had the day off from work, and he comes downstairs seeing me like this in front of my computer. And the Smurfs are coming out. They swoon, you know? And uh, yeah. he says, are you watching the Smurfs? John, this is worse. Recent. <laughs> and it honestly was. <coughs> I love it. But that is what a good translator will do, is we will go that extra mile to make sure it's right. Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, yeah, I'm glad I did, because I would have made a lot of mistakes had I not done so. <laughs> but uh, yes, I mean, it's like you say, all these little things. For example, uh, I remember one of my first assignments was someone trying to explain how we need to be culturally sensitive before we prepare for an assignment. So they asked us to choose a country. Uh, there's this book called Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands that can help you in business situations to explain if you're meeting a client from another country, what you want to perhaps avoid doing and what you and what are good things to do that you're not normally thinking of in American situations. Uh, the country I chose was Vietnam. And I found out that especially in Southeast Asia, you have to be careful about showing the bottom of your feet if you cross your legs seeing the bottom of someone's feet is perceived as rude. Well, if I would read a, if I would be translating a book and they would mention that so-and-so crossed her legs in that country, I would want to know, okay, I'd have to contact the author. Do you want her to put that she perhaps crossed her legs, her feet at the ankles, for example, mm -hmm. close to the ground? Mm -hmm. If you want her foot to be turned up in the air, is this going to cause an incident? Because I haven't seen it. And if so, you know, I, I just want to know these final touches because someone from that culture might read, why didn't the hostess object? Why wasn't there an insult felt? You know, these are little touches that we really will research. Because I love it. When I was in Kuwait, and I hate occupying all your time here. Oh, you're fine. But uh, I was telling my Kuwaiti and Iraqi buddies about all these things we were told that were cultural. You know, don't do this and that. And they looked at each other confused, and finally one said. Well, that's the stupid Saudis that believe that stuff. <laughs> so once again, it's not across the board with just because you know they, they seem mm -hmm. to be all Arabs or something like that. Exactly. Uh, actually, in that book, it went through each culture. I, I read through the whole book because I just was fascinated by it. I got my copy of it. And yes, you're right. I mean, every culture has a different thing to think about. Like uh, we we, were, we took our honeymoon and uh, well, we took a 10th anniversary trip to Ireland. That's where I, it came up. You know, I was reading. You know, like if someone invites you to uh, the pub for a drink. If you're an hour late, it's okay. Because, uh, see, the Irish like to do everything the opposite of the English from what we understand. The English like to be punctual. Well, so the Irish will, well, yeah, bird. yeah. If you're an hour late, that's fine. It was very yeah. casual over there. And uh, so we found that, okay, this is great. But it, it always helps to be prepared. And that's what translators and interpreters, that's what we like to do. We like to learn about new cultures and we like we like these word problems, like, uh, okay, I know I've mentioned BBC several times, but I, I've read Sherlock Holmes from back before there was ever a series. My grandfather was an English literature major, and he passed his love of any kind of writing on to me. So I had like the Sherlock Holmes book from the 1950s that has the beautiful illustrations in it. 
And uh, that's honestly how I am when I start a project. I go from zero to 60. When I'm working, I'm working. I'm very intense. I really care about the work. And my husband knows if she's at her desk, don't interrupt. Because if you interrupt me in the middle of a sentence, I have to start from the beginning of the sentence to make sure it flows well. And he knows that I will remind him of that. Interrupts the sentence. Yes, exactly. Interrupts the flow. Sometimes it interrupts the image. Yep. And uh, it, can, it, it can affect the entire way the, 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 the image is perceived, the vocabulary I choose. And I take that very, very seriously. And so that's honestly how I like to describe it is I feel like Sherlock Holmes on a case. I don't stop until the case is done. Any other questions? Any other comments? Question. You're giving us so much wonderful information. I'm not interested or qualified. <laughs> in becoming a translator, but I'd like to know what path did you take? Did you always want to be a translator? How did you become a translator? I thought I was meant to be a teacher. That honestly is how I got into languages. My mom all spoke Cajun, and uh, I came home from school one day after third grade and said I learned about the Cajuns. And she said, may I'm a Cajun, Sha, and that floored me because I'd never actually studied anything in school that had a personal connection to my family. And I just was hooked on anything French. And I was lucky because I, a lot of my friends, um, see I grew up near Lake Charles, and I'm probably stating a cultural stereotype, but I find in the western part of the state, um, a lot of people when they hear that the kids are learning French, they don't talk to the grandkids because they know it's the standard French from France. My grandma wasn't like that. She would talk to me. She had trouble understanding me sometimes, but she would talk with me. And we would speak in French. And if there was a word or two we didn't understand, then we'd break into English, hash it out, and like uh, ice cream. She'd say, I'd say, la glace. She'd say, oh, we say creme glace. i say, oh, okay. And then we'd break back into French. Right. But I grew up with that. And uh, I wanted to bring that to students. And I just found, um, I tried to teach for two years. I don't have the personality to be in this classroom. I, I just don't. I, I find I, I actually enjoy the fundamentals of translation a lot more. And uh, so I went through different things. I got involved in tourism, uh, became a set, bilingual secretary for a while. But then, uh, my mother learned about the American Translator Association because she taught the career section as a home ec part of the home economics course. So I did some research into them and decided to go to grad school. But they are actually, uh, I would say, if anyone is starting out, especially in school, you can find programs that have a bachelor's degree and master's degree specifically in translation, and sometimes in the language you're looking for. I would actually say that that would be the route I would go if I could do it again, because. Um, you know, I could learn so many strategies just by taking five semesters, but if I could have really made that my major, I would be 10 times the translator I am now. And so that would be advice I would give. Yes? One of the things that bugs me about the way the language is changing, the English mm -hmm. language, I hear me and Joe went to the... Thank you. Or, and I was taught that the words few, fewer, fewer, and less, less mm -hmm. means a certain amount, whereas fewer means numbers. Mm -hmm. so, and I don't see the word fewer, fewer being used anymore. Less is replacing it. Uh, I know. So, As translators, sometimes. There's like two schools of thought for us, because the more traditional ones, uh, we lament the fall of grammar. And uh, but some of them are like, wow, emojis are cool. This is a new way of communicating. Let's talk about that. And there are some people who've written extant book about the communication of emojis. So it's really uh, this interesting thing that has broken into not just tr languages, but translation itself. <coughs> and um, I have to admit, uh, I, I do sometimes some survey questions where people express if they like a product or not. By the way, people say the darndest things when they write those in. It is, it is actually a lot of fun for me sometimes because uh, some people give me a good laugh. Just, the, it, it is not because I think that what they wrote is, is, is bad. It's because sometimes they just say very funny things. And so I tend to enjoy those assignments because I like what they say. And if the product is good, I, I keep on the lookout for it. Like if they're saying that there's a new sandwich, a Subway, that has a good flavor, you bet I want that on the menu. And I'm, and I'm looking for it. I'm still looking for it. They got some good flavors on them. They bring me to Quebec, but they have not brought here. They need to bring them down yeah. here. Oh my gosh. But anyway, what I'm just saying is I do have a lot of texting jargon that gets locked into those. So I'm constantly searching for 
the text in, uh, I get sent especially Italian and French for those, so I'm always checking to make sure, okay, before I say that this is just key jargon, you know, because sometimes people just type in a bunch of letters together for a laugh. But before I say that, I want to make sure that this really doesn't mean something specific, because sometimes it does. And I, I, I will go spend 10 minutes on that if I have to, just to make sure that that one text is right. But yeah, I mean, it matters to me. I really care about that. I like accuracy. I mean, if I, that's one thing that I found, um, I've done some medical documents before, some doctor's reports, and the one thing that really irks me is bad handwriting. And I know that doctors have very important jobs, but I, I really think that we could solve any employment shortages by hiring stenographers to follow them. Type up yes. everything they say, and that way we could all read their reports. There would be handwriting issues. Because the scary thing is sometimes I look at a word, and it looks like a line with just a few indentations, and I have to say whether that's someone's arm or leg. That makes a big difference when you're going to send this document out. And uh, so that's one thing, like, uh, it really bugs me when I honestly cannot make a word out and I have to write the words illegible. Because uh, sometimes you have to. And it breaks my heart because I'm thinking this is going to be, this is going to break the text. This is going to be an issue. They're not going to know what this says. This could make a big difference in someone's life, their care. But I can't make it out. And I have typed it into every medical dictionary with every spelling I can think of, and I still can't find it. That breaks my heart. So like I say, it's not just in grammar. It's handwriting, too. You know, I really care about accuracy. And uh, that's my pet peeve. What category do you love to translate in? <laughs> if I could, I would do children's literature. Right. I just really enjoy that. I, I'm a kid at heart. I have an, uh, a niece. She's five, tall for a five, and uh, she means the world to me. And um, I would honestly love to be able to say I translated something that made her smile. I guess so. That's what I'm thinking of. Cause and that's amazing because we do have them. people that ask, you know, or they're considering having their children books mm -hmm. translated. <coughs> that would be my sweet spot if I really could. That, that really is my single happiest memory as a translator, was doing those Smurf books, as crazy as that sounds, just because I love kids. And I'd rather someone who loves it translating it mm -hmm. than somebody who's just doing it. Um, yeah, that's my sweet so spot. I can see that. I mean, I do plenty of other things. Like, I actually like medical translating, too. You know, the people you get to meet and uh, that you see in there, I mean, you really learn a lot about people. Really see what they've been through, and you see their pain. And I mean, pain is pain is pain, no matter who's experiencing pain. Yeah. And uh, it's very sobering when you're translating for someone who only has one arm, and he insists on opening the door for you. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's nothing that can prepare you for someone who still. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I honestly am so grateful I got into this career because I've met so many people, and they've changed my life. Well, I wanted to add to that. We're so glad that you're part of this group, and you're the only translator that's ever graced our presence here. <laughs> and you've done a little presentation before, but this one is really on a different I'm uh, older. angle of it. It's I, wonderful. I've learned. I love it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've given so a many lot. things to think about. I, I mean, know. It's, it's, it's like, <laughs> I never thought about it. I know, and I was thinking, oh my, oh my gosh. gosh, I'm throwing the Mount Everest, and I hope I'm not doing that. But no, it's, it's informative. It really I just know is. what I've learned from, it. and I know what I've seen, and I know that this is the best way to like help you put your best foot forward. You know. Um, okay, so I noticed <coughs> Amazon.com has they're creating more and more Amazon stores from several countries: mm -hmm. Brazil, so which is Portuguese, oh, Japan, and it's India, and on and on. Do you? have any testimonies from your friends who have translated a book from English published in, in the U.S., sold on Amazon, but decided to get their book published in a foreign language yeah. to be sold in that Amazon store in Brazil or Italy or someplace, because thinking as a publisher, mm -hmm. I want to cover all the bases and make as much money as I can mm -hmm. from each book that I have yeah. if that means getting it translated into foreign languages. Yes. So I was wondering if you knew of anybody who uh, had success having their book translated from English into other foreign languages 
and you know if they if, the, if it was worth their while and worth the money spent I would say I don't know anyone specifically you know in that area so I would say you'd have to just look at each work and go to their Amazon page you can see how the book ranks I would say that would be your best judge I just know that some uh, <coughs> some translators approach authors that they find on Amazon uh, they do this sometimes with independent writers they say you know I've noticed your book or would you be interested in having it translated I I translate this to my language they give a resume and uh, it all depends on the relationship between each writer and so uh, I, I hesitate to speak. Um, I would say sometimes uh, when you're ready to talk to a translator, just be prepared for them sometimes to ask specific questions about the work. Some of them may express personal caveats. Um, I was reading an article where one woman said uh, that because she does legal interpreting sometimes and she has had child abuse cases, that she would not translate anything that would show children that were overly sexualized because it just was too close to home because she'd seen too much of the dark side of that. Yeah. And so those are just certain things that may come up with translators. Some people may ask you, okay, regarding language, um, do you want, like if someone uh, is expressing frustration, do you want to say, oh darn, or do you want to go to the other extreme? Because I've had some cases where some people say, if you see profanity uh, for this document, just put expletive or profanity and move on, don't actually translate the word. Some places will say, we need to know exactly what they say, so if you're prepared, you're going to hear some pretty strong language and just, you know, and uh, after the, you, you have to remind yourself at the end of that assignment not to wash your own mouth out with soap because you know that you didn't mean it. But uh, like I say, sometimes you have to, you know, there's going to be back and forth, and so just dealing with the, those issues, they all kind of fall into the same area is, they're all individual. You know, I don't know anyone who's actually been in that area per se with translation, so I, I don't feel comfortable qualifying on talking on that area. All right, so I have written a children's book, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I'm an author, blah, blah, blah. You expect it to be already published and everything, and you just need to translate it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that needs to be a published work, finished everything. Mm -hmm. It's already gone through all the editing, yeah. the publishing, and you're just going to turn it out into whatever language you mm -hmm. translate? Yes. Okay, so then after that, okay, you give the references as far as where to take it from there? Yeah, that's I'm like just that. asking the question because a lot of authors mm -hmm. are seriously would love their children books. You know, like a, if a publisher contacts me, uh, then maybe they have an after long, but I know that if a publisher contacts me, that's, that's different. You know, they most likely have the budget. Okay. I don't have to really worry about that. Uh, <coughs> it's been just a tough po you know, process of going through the editor, getting the agent. So the publisher could do all of that and get that yeah. out together. And that happens sometimes too. And there's the middleman. And actually, that was another option I wanted to mention to you is I personally recommend going to freelance translators for your work because freelance translators, you actually get to speak to the translator. It's a direct connection. However, you can also approach certain translation agencies. They, if you go on the same American Translator Association webpage, you can do a search for translation agencies. And they do specify in literary translation. What that guarantees you is you will have a project manager. And that project manager will be in charge of finding the translator for you. And any issues you have, you can talk to the project manager. It's just the one catch is you do have the middleman. And it will cost you more because they have to pay the company on top of the translator. So that's why I would say I, I really think a freelance translator is the best fit for an author because you eliminate the middleman and also it is more economical. And uh, I personally, I think it's better when you don't have to wait for, okay, I've sent so and so an email, I'm waiting to hear what they say, and then five hours later, okay, now I can continue. I mean, I've already continued, but I've had to mark that part, that part and I'm hoping I don't forget that I bookmarked that page, you know, because I've moved on to 23 pages later. So that's... You know, that's what we're looking for. So I think that when you have the more direct communication, it eliminates just those tiny little glitches. All right, great, thank you. Okay, we are getting to, as everybody should know, Barnes and Noble closes at nine o'clock. We usually end our meetings around 8.30. It's uh, about 8.15. Anything else that you'd like to share or any other questions? I, I fear that I might start repeating myself and have a bad habit of that, so I'd better just let y'all okay, ask Okay, is there any the other questions, anybody? Anybody? Okay. Um, well, we want to thank you very much. Very Okay. And uh, we need to present our own firm gift certificate. Do the honor. You need a third job, right? There we go. I gave I know, I'm giving it back. You?
I like your pictures better, right? Go ahead. Here we go. It's our, um, it's our pleasure to give you a small token of our appreciation Thank you. for coming and being our guest speaker. Yay, that was wonderful. We are, Thank we are you so now much. digitally formed in that, in that camera. No going back. No going back. That's it. It's Thank laid you. Down in wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, now I would like to, how many children authors are, well, hi there. I better lay than never. That's what I say. <laughs> how many uh, authors are here that write children's books? Okay, I'd like to have a, I'd like to make a reminder announcement. This Saturday, the last Saturday of the month, every month, something new has taken place at the farmer's market on Johnson Street. From 8 to 12, the last Saturday of the month, there is a tent that features authors of children's books. So, through many years of us trying to get out there, somebody managed to get them to accept the possibility of always doing this. So, if you're an author of children's books, you might be interested in going and checking out introducing yourself to the tent that's out there. I do not know the person that shared this info is not here tonight, but this will be the second Saturday. He is going to start sending me the flyers, and I'll start posting it by email. Uh, so if you're a member, paid member, you'll get, I'm going to start sending the flyers out. I always post on Facebook anyway. So I want you to know this has something I've been trying for for eight years. I didn't make it, but somebody else did, so I am all excited. And it's one tent with many authors of children, one genre. We had tents out there where we had every genre out there. And so they would not allow us to set up something like that. So be sure to mark your calendar the last Saturday of every month, 8 to 12 at the Farmer's Market. Now, I try to get the gentleman to give me the information like what tent number? You know, because that's got a lot of stuff out there. So I'd say as soon as you get there, if you go, ask somebody where is the tent that has the children authors because man it's grown a lot music food now an author tent out there so with that said um, we want to thank we have uh, three people tonight before we close out I would like to uh, recognize again you are and where are you from sir Dr. Daniel Aaron Smith Danny Tiel I'm originally from Marion Louisiana Union Parish and I moved to Lafayette to get a Doctorate with a Southern Literature Creed, uh, especially area in the Creative Writing Dissertation. And he teaches? Teaches, I teach English at South Louisiana. There you college. go. All right. Oh, Thank hi. you so much for coming. And sir? Michael Verrett. I'm all the way from Denham Springs, Louisiana. Yay. I have some friends in the room. And uh, I've been involved with, I've written and illustrated about 40 children's books and another 10 to 12 more that I've worked with other people on, Barnes & Noble, Mascot, Amazon.com, those people, if you run my name, you'll see the books on them. So you're just running through or you visiting us? Oh, I'm visiting you folks, yeah. Aww, I, I, also, so I'm much. from St. Mary Parish, I used to talk like this just a little bit more. <laughs> and my relatives, they up in Cankton, you got to go through Vatican City to get this. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, we I'm sorry, sir. You were you were, you were uh, you're also an illustrator, I see. Yes. Yes. Okay. He was doodling on his thing the whole yeah. time, and yet uh, I, I work for the speak. governor's office. I'm the only one allowed to draw whenever the governor is speaking, uh, okay. because they know if they bug me, they may end up in a cartoon someplace <laughs> on the bathroom wall. Well, I was going to say, okay, so it's hard detective. What detective? Yes. Okay, so I'm thinking, okay, is this some yeah, kind of character in one of the books that you uh, No, no, I, I do children's books. I have my oldest granddaughter is five, and she sometimes provides uh, inspiration. Where have you been? Pardon? You've been everywhere but here. Uh, right? I was also a colonel in the Army, and after I retired from the police department, the Army decided I should travel and see the world, so I found myself doing 14 months in the war over there, doing special projects out of the Pentagon. And so that was part of the travel. But you now, just never know who's going to be in our, our midst, huh? Well, please go visit the little tents if yeah. you're in town Saturday. Uh, this Saturday, there's a fundraiser. I was made the president of something called Spotlight Theater. We do ra uh, ra uh, programs for the vets. 
So oh, we dress wonderful. in period costume from the 40s. We have our own band, and that uh, we have Abbott and Costello sometimes, Blondie and Dag would come on the stage, and we do this all. We have our own non for profits we run these things out of. So you're doing a fundraiser this weekend? Yeah, Where? yeah. We have a cookie bake sale for, uh, it's called Spring Fest in Denham Springs, Louisiana. Indiana Springs. Yeah, so I'll be out there pushing cookies. Pushing. And who was a friend that you came here with, Carrie? Uh, no, I'm just by myself. Just by yourself? How'd you find out we were here? Even uh, because I was at, uh, uh, we were at uh, the Bayou Tech. Uh, uh -huh. uh, right. And I, walked hey, into great. Them. And I had met folks because I'm also a board member with Ver uh, with uh, Creative Minds uh, Writers Group yes. out mm -hmm. of Ponchatoula. And uh, so we interact a lot, uh, yeah. many of the folks of us in the room here. And so I knew it was the last day of the month one of these days, and that sometimes it changed. So I, I contacted somebody by email and they said, yes, it'll be on Tuesday. So. Well, I'm so glad that you came to our meeting. You sure did add a lot and interest and author of how many books? Uh, I've been involved in 50-something books. I've lost yeah. count. Do you have a web page? <laughs> uh, the Amazon has a web page for me. I got your name. So Go yeah, just run the name and the word books behind it. I have my own non-for-profit, so I spend a lot of time doing programs in awesome. schools and libraries. My cost is a Coca-Cola or a Dr. Pepper. But I have a doctor who said it should be bottled water instead. So <laughs> I'm fairly cheap to get. That sounds like a workshop yeah. in the future. He was, huh? he was next to me at the pond. That sounds like a workshop in the future. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I got his name. Okay. I'm going to check it out and check with you also. Yeah. Well, we're so glad that you're here. And also, I know you said you've been here one time before. One, once before, several months back. And what, where are you from and what do you like to write in? Um, I'm from Lafayette, but I live in Youngville now. Uh, and I like to write. I did a children's book years ago. I haven't published it though, but um, but I like to write historical romance based in the mid nineteen hundreds. Well, since you're not that far away, Michael Verrett, we might uh, be interested in maybe getting you to come and do a little workshop. Coca Cola for us. or a Dr Pepper. Oh, we'll give you a little bit and, more than and that. And if you forget, I bring my own. That's my. Uh, you bring your what? I you bring my own. Bring my own Coke. Oh, well, great. Oh, my stuff. My stuff wonderful. Speaks. Seriously, I uh, took down your name, and we're going to be. Setting up some meeting workshops in the future. Um, we do 10 to 2, we do 2 hours, and we do 10 to 12, and we uh, at a library. The, you know, there is no culture in Baton Rouge. You have to come to Lafayette to go to New Orleans and find it, <laughs> and fine dining as well. So. Ooh, hey, a nice meal will do it too, huh? Listen, I, I'm excited. I will check out your website and we will discuss this thing. You sound very interesting. And we do need more on children's books. We do need more encouragement. And thanks to you, now we can tell people a little bit more information. Well, thank you so much, everybody, and you. Hi. I'm glad that you were able to come in tonight. <coughs> You're looking good. Everything's going good for you, too, right? Awesome. Miss Gary, thank you very much for coming, everybody, this year. And remember, next month is poetry competition, and it's going to be Mother May I since it's along the terms of Mother's Day. And so we will be sending out a newsletter. If you're not on the email list, you, you have to be a paid member. It pays to be on the list because you get the website, you get resources, and you get updates, which we're gonna have to be doing. I'm hoping tonight they'll clear us to have an extension, and I think we're gonna call it uh, gold mining. I like that, what do you think, Lewis? Sure. Yeah, we're going to have a new extension. Hopefully, they clear us the second Tuesday of every month, but we will send an email out to confirm it. And Lewis is going to take a spin of doing another event outside of here on the same location, same time. And we're going to be kind of get ideas of how to create characters. And I'm excited about that. I think that's great. We just, if you haven't got anything planned on Tuesday night, it seems to work out for everybody. But, Thank you very much, and check out our webpage, please. If you have any questions or, or you want a certain topic, you know, in the future of speakers, for example, we're booked up through the rest of the year right now, but come next year, we want to be able to get topics that you're interested in. And what is the website? The website is www.a, oh, Lord, I almost gave a television station website, uh, www.writers. Acadiana.org. Okay, and uh, that gives you information, published authors. It's all good. So thank you if you want to mingle. They push us out unless they change the hours again by 9 o'clock.